All right, guys, welcome back to Title Gardens. And this is another episode of Reef Receipts here with Brandy. So there are a lot of questions that we have in this hobby. And in many ways, this hobby is extremely advanced. But sometimes these questions that we have have been addressed by the scientific community already. And a lot of times we as hobbyists were just completely ignorant of what studies have been done. So we created this series to kind of take a look at some of the scientific journals out there. Some of them are more applicable than others, but at least we are checking the receipts. So what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about algae as a reservoir of coral pathogens. That's the okay. title of the paper. Because we already kind of know that algae growing in and around corals is not the greatest thing in the whole wide world. That's why we try to go to great lengths to attempt to control algae growth. We're trying to like eliminate phosphates and stuff if that does anything for algae. Yeah. But we're, we're trying to like minimize algal invasion. Yeah. Algae and coral are competitors for yes. the same space. And uh. this study is kind of, it's not really directly looking at just algae bad. It's specifically algae is bad because bacteria. Yeah. Like we know algae can shade coral. If coral's not getting sunlight, it's going to die, like, is what it is. But they had noticed some patterns that exist when certain coral pathogens, like white band disease or yellow band disease, occur. There's often an outbreak of algae nearby. So it got them thinking, maybe the algae's actually spreading this disease to the corals. Okay. So they were like, let's go test it out. So their question was, does algae spread pathogenic bacteria or ciliates to coral? So they're looking at bacteria. Bacteria and ciliates. Yeah. And they're one of the first studies to look at ciliates specifically. So that's interesting. And what they concluded was that, yeah, algae might be spreading pathogens to coral. Okay, maybe. Sure. The whole ciliates thing is kind of a new thing to me because every now and again we do see ciliates here now for the folks out there that are kind of unfamiliar with ciliates they are super tiny like the only reason that we ever see them is we have access to some pretty intense like macro lenses and things like that on professional cinema gear (laughs) and Short of that, you really don't see ciliates. Like, if you had a an acropora, for example, two inches from the glass, and you're looking at it, you know, this far away, a couple inches, you will not see ciliates. They are that small. Like, if, uh, if you guys are out there are familiar with, like, red bugs, a lot of people have a hard time seeing red bugs because they are that small. Ciliates are small. Ciliates are like one fiftieth <laughs> of that size sometimes. Like they are practically undetectable. However, I've seen ciliates on corals that were struggling, and I've also seen ciliates on coral that have never been healthier. Like, I think I have uh, some video of ciliates on, like, a Walt Disney acro. And its its polyp extension was the best we've ever recorded, and its color was the best we've ever recorded. So, I get, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm iffy on, like, how bad, quote-unquote, are ciliates? How bad is bacteria? So, yeah, they, these, these, are the, these are the questions that are going through my head jump, on, the, on the jump off right here. They did not find ciliate DNA on healthy coral, but they did see say that they saw it with their eyes. Like on the, under their microscopes, they saw ciliates on the healthy coral. They did find ciliate DNA on unhealthy coral. Okay. And they also found ciliate DNA on algae. They also found bacteria on algae that they also found on unhealthy coral but wasn't on healthy coral so their whole definition of whether or not a 
cilia or a bacteria was a pathogen kind of relies on this idea of where they found it and where they didn't find it. Okay, and and their conclusion once again was that they felt that algae was like a vector for these um, pathogenic Pathogen. infections and, and things of that sort. Yeah. Okay. Because there is there is some overlap, right? Like if there is some overlap, that was their idea. Maybe the algae spreading it. But I think you have to look a lot at how they were collecting this data. So they they went out to the Great Barrier Reef in um, Venezuela. So that's two places, Venezuela, the Caribbean, <laughs> yeah. and the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Okay. So two very different places. Okay. If you look them up on a map, one's like a resort, one is isolated in the middle of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd love to visit both. <laughs> you probably don't want to visit both. <laughs> Just, just going to throw not. that out there. <laughs> Fair. I have friends from Venezuela. <laughs> they don't recommend it. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to yeah. Australia then. How about that? Sure. Um, and they're looking at two different diseases, white syndrome at the Great Barrier Reef and yellow band disease in the Caribbean. And their results are vastly different between the two, uh-huh. as you might expect. What they did, they went out, they collected samples of algae and corals and the coral, they made sure they had healthy and unhealthy and transition tissue, which means like part of it's healthy, part of it's sick. And they went out and collected these in tubes, three samples of each at several different places, brought it back on the boat, put, removed the water, put in alcohol, froze it, all this stuff, took it off, centrifuged it, and looked for DNA. I was just laughing when I was reading this because they're talking about a novel method that they use in their sampling method, which was that they, when I used to do this, we would get tissue samples and we would crush them. And we would use some type of like detergent or something that would break the cell membranes because DNA is actually locked inside of cells. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just free floating. So if you want to find DNA, it needs to be present in a sample. So if it's not present in a zam- sample because it's inside of a bag, the cell, you're not going to see it. Um, well, they didn't do anything to break those bags. Okay. So they just collected these samples, put them in test tubes, and just spun them. Yeah. And then they're and then they're, then they're running it through a gel or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they're doing gel electrophoresis to figure out what bacteria is there. Uh huh. So that's already like a point of possible user error there. Yeah. And they they made an argument that it was okay because they did find some of the coral DNA in the samples that they sent off. So they're like, well, some of these cells must have ruptured to some degree because they have the coral DNA. Mm-hmm. But it's still not like... They even called it a novel method. They're like, our novel method. I'm like, or the wrong method. <laughs> or it, just, it could just be whack. Yeah. <laughs> whack technique. Because uh, I was, you know, when you just were saying that, I was thinking, not only is, or are we just talking about just like cells? Now you're talking about algae. And algae, it has cell walls. Which are thicker than a bacteria cell. Exactly. There's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get through cell walls, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of not wonderful. And so they use that as an excuse. Well, they don't actually ever use that as an excuse for walking back their conclusion of algae spreads pathogens. But they do walk back that a little bit. And they're coming up with all kinds of reasons except for their novel collection method. And I think almost everything that they walk back on, I'm like, or maybe you shouldn't have sampled it that way. Half their samples found no bacteria. And I think like we all know bacteria is everywhere, right? (laughs) Handling a sample should get you some bacteria, right? Like your hands. I mean, it should be sterile. Like they're using sterile technique. But you think the second they open up that vial underwater that it's going to get full of all kinds of bacteria. Maybe they use too sterile technique. Maybe maybe it wasn't the crushing. Maybe they <laughs> maybe they autoclave their sample, <laughs> which they didn't mention. I, I'm just like throwing that in there. So they, they got samples with zero bacteria. Yeah. So okay. some of their algae samples had no bacteria. Also, some of their bacteria profiles don't match what other studies say. So like when you do a study, you go back and you compare it to other people's things. Some people had similar things. A lot of people had very dissimilar things. 
and they blamed it on um, maybe the algae has this bacteria, but it's endosymbiotic, like it's okay. inside the algae. So that is, is that once again a cell wall problem? We yeah. couldn't detect it because it was like in a, a bunker? Yeah. Like, okay. Which, so, which goes back to their novel. novel collection technique. Yeah. Which could have been an issue. Yeah. But, but it's not an issue because they're not really addressing it directly. Not not here. Like they, mm-hmm. they made the argument early on that it was okay because they found coral DNA, so, which could be the mucus that the coral let off and uh-huh. they broke it off, right? But they're, they're not addressing it and their conclusions as problematic. Okay. I think it's problematic. It sounds problematic. <laughs> <laughs> you don't find bacteria in some of the samples. Sounds like a good source of error. Okay. And then something else that kind of concerned me a little bit was their definition of what pathogenic bacteria or ciliates were. So they were specifically looking at ciliates or bacteria that were in unhealthy coral, but not healthy coral. So if it was found in both, they kicked it out of their study. Okay. And that's problematic because, as we know, like. It's possible to have something and, and not necessarily be a problem, but it could be a problem later. Getting sick with a cold, you probably had the cold before you start showing symptoms. Yeah. Because, so for, for example, like my cat has an upper respiratory infection, which is like a viral thing. It's permanent, it's not something you can cure, but it's. 99% of the time, it, there's no, there's really no symptoms of it. Mm-hmm. But if her immune system tanks for some reason, then she's going to get a flare-up of, like, the upper respiratory issues. So she would normally <laughs> – she has some health issues. But <laughs> n- assuming that she's a normally healthy cat with an upper respiratory infection, this study, by that definition, would be like, that is not – a pathogenic issue. Yeah, that that would be kicked out and not looked at again. Yeah. And one of the specific bacteria they kicked out <laughs> that they talked about is Vibrio. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, we found this non-pathogenic Vibrio because it was in healthy and unhealthy coral. Yeah, and yeah, so for the folks at home, like Vibrio is kind of like one of the most, I guess, like accepted pathogenic well, bacteria because yeah. there's, there's different types of vibrio granted mm-hmm. but i think that that's it's it's almost always brought up as being like a very likely source of coral disease and that was like kind of their gold standard too like they were using that as if we find vibrio which we think we should then our methods are okay and they found the vibrio but they're like oh but it's not pathogenic Some of the the biggest things, though, were that algae isn't a problem unless it's touching the coral, which we kind of know. Yeah. Sure, I I agree with that. Maybe algae spreads bacteria or ciliates to coral that hurts it. But I don't think that this study is the one that's going to tell us that algae is spreading diseases. Yeah. So... I, I guess this kind of you know speaks to like a, a larger point that we're trying to make with this series is that it is great that there are studies out there because at least you know there was like some effort to in, in a controlled fashion come to some some kind of usable results or interesting results or something like they that. They found ciliates that were they think were likely pathogenic. Yeah. Sometimes though <laughs> like so again we, we call this series reef receipts but sometimes like they're just weak receipts you know and they are receipts but mm. I think it shows like how sometimes the hobby's ahead of what is going on in science yeah it's and, and like just it's just like you said it's like it could very well be true but it's not true because of these guys necessarily, <laughs> uh, and you know it begs the question: like, it was 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 there better studies out there? And oftentimes, it's really tr- difficult to track down better studies. Sometimes it's just thin out there. I mean, they say that there were no studies like this done at this point, and this was 2013. I did find one from 2023 looking at algae because I just wanted to see 
and they're repeating some of the same stuff, but they tend to hang more on the idea that algae weakens coral so that it's more likely to be infected, not necessarily that the algae is carrying the pathogen. It might have the pathogen, but not that that's the primary source of disease. Hmm. That kind of goes back to my cat example. <laughs> okay, so no, f- f- follow me. Follow me on this one, okay? Because usually what causes like the flare-up in my cat is when I have to give her steroids for her asthma. And the steroids tank her immune system. Mm. So what they're saying is like, no, no, no. The, this thing isn't even like an, a vector for bacteria or pathogens or ciliates or whatever. But it is somehow knocking down the, the, the coral's ability to fight off something else. Mm-hmm. And that's what's causing it. So, uh, it, it, so that's a different receipt. <laughs> but yeah, it could be. But it took 10 years to get there from this. Yeah. And I, I think I, that's something that I, I don't know that hobbyists or people in general realize that science is slow. So I don't know, guys. What do you think? Do you, I mean, obviously. Algae's bad. Algae, not, not the greatest thing in the world as a, as a direct <laughs> competitor. For algae is bad to grow on coral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, I mean, which is kind of a, a bummer because I think that a lot of times people are trying to incorporate like an algae filled system. Just decoratively. Yeah, algae can be pretty. But I think that there might be some some serious issues with that. You know, just, just given like this backdrop, um, again, not the strongest data out there, but it is data, which is good to at least review. Thanks very much, Brandy, for taking a look at that. Thanks I, for letting me do this. Yeah. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. And until next time, happy reefing. Bye, guys. <laughs>